Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Waving at Joe over there in the corner. It sure is good to be here. It's always encouraging to come here on the Lord's Day and be able to worship our Heavenly Father. Certainly grateful for your presence and grateful for the, uh, the time that you have um, set aside for, for, this, uh, for this worship service. We look forward to this. We're going to uh, have something a little different uh, this Sunday. I'll be, I'll be leading singing, you know, so I, um, I hope that goes well. <laughs> and, uh, so, we, so please sing out and uh, help me out a little bit. As we uh, begin this service, uh, let's, let's try to uh, focus on what we're doing here. Let's try to think about the, the meaning of, of coming here and assembling. And let's try our hardest to, to clear our minds of our worldly concerns. And let's, let's spend this time really focusing on worshiping our, our Heavenly Father. The first song we'll be singing is 417, Heavenly Sunlight. 417, if you're using your hymnal. I always grew up hearing this song as walking in sunlight. I don't know when it ever became heavenly sunlight, but. <clears throat> walking in sunlight, part of my journey, over the mountains, through the deep sunshine in my soul. <clears throat> there is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in the earth is done. Oh, happy moments roll away. 
Will you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have this time to gather together and to sing songs of praise and to worship you. Father, just help us to remember that every blessing that we have comes through you. Father, we're so honored that you loved us enough that you gave your only son to die on the cross for us. Help us, Father, we ask you to help us to remember that we are nothing without you, that every opportunity, every blessing is through you. Father, we ask you to be with the leaders of our country and to guide them to where they would do things that would be pleasing to you. Father, we just ask you as brothers and sisters to help us to look around and to be willing to share the word to those that do not know you. Father, we know at times we disappoint you and we stumble and we fall. Help us to remember that you forgive us and that we can rise up again and carry on. Father, just help us to enjoy your, your word and to share with others. Father, we ask you to be with Sean as he brings us uh, a lesson from your word. Help us to take it into our lives and apply it and to share it with those that do not know you. Help us to stand strong in the word and to be servants like your son and to, to serve others. Father, we just ask you to be with each and every family here today. Be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One ninety nine in your hymnal. If you're using your hymnal, there is a slight variation in how this is worded. So when you get to the chorus, there's a few extra words in there, so just ignore that. It's not in the paperless hymnal. 199, blue skies and rainbows. <clears throat> blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven I can see when my Lord is living in me. Jesus is Lord and alive today. He makes His home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since He promised me that we never would part. Green grass and flowers all blue. 
I know we're not singing all the verses, but I don't remember which verses we're not singing. So pay attention to what's on the, on the board if you're using your hymnal. 134, Lamb of God. And this is the song before, before the Lord's Supper. Let's sing this. <clears throat> your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sinned. If you have the elements ready, the uh, bread and fruit of the vine, if you'll get that out, and uh, those of you here and uh, watching online as well, uh, will participate together in the communion here in a moment. Um, I want to ask you a question as we as we begin this uh, memorial: Do do you like things that are good, or do you like things that are better? You know, if you go and, and buy a car and the salesman says, you know, we have this car and it's a good car. It'll get you to work and back, but you've got to crank the windows and air conditioner doesn't work real well, but it's, it's a good car. Or we have this better one uh, with GPS and, you know, the windows go up and down on their own and it's nice and cool. Which one do you, do you want? The other example I thought of this morning, if you go to back when we used to go, if you went to Logan's or uh, Texas Roadhouse and you said, I want a baked potato. And they said, well, we can get you a baked potato or we can get you a loaded baked potato. What's the difference? Well, it's better. It's a lot better. You know, um, when we think about Jesus and we think about the relationship that we have now as the writer to the Hebrews describes it, what we have in Jesus is better than what they had under the old covenant. What they had was good. The law was good, was holy, was righteous. The relationship they had with God was, was good. They didn't always treat it that way, but it was, uh, it was good. But what we have in Jesus is so much better. And that's what the writer is talking about here in chapters 7 and 8, uh, actually 
yeah, 7 and 8, I'll mention a couple of verses where he uses that word better as he talks about what we have in Jesus in the new covenant as compared to the old. He says in verse 19 that on the other hand, in this new covenant, there is a bringing in of a better hope, a better hope. There was a hope in the old system, but there is now a better hope. He talks about the two covenants. In uh, verse 22, he says, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The old covenant was a good covenant, but the new covenant is better. He then talks about the ministry that Jesus has and what he does uh, in terms of his role as, a, as the high priest. And he says in verse 6 of chapter 8, he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. Better hope, better covenant, better promises, better ministry. Everything about the covenant, the new covenant, is better. This relationship that we have with God through Jesus because of his sacrifice, which we're about to uh, remember in the eating and the drinking together. Uh, everything about that covenant is better. This relationship that we have with God is so tremendous. And we, uh, we observe the, the Lord's Supper to remember this sacrifice that Jesus made that makes that relationship possible. So as we um, prepare to, to partake together, uh, if you'll get the bread available, uh, we'll pray together, and then uh, you are encouraged to partake. Would you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for life. We're grateful for uh, the tremendous blessings that we enjoy. We're grateful most of all, Father, for our relationship with you. We know that we have it through Jesus. We know that it is based upon his sacrifice. Uh, we know that it is a better covenant a better relationship, a better environment. Everything about it is better because of what Jesus has done for us. And we're so grateful, Father. Father, thank you for this bread which reminds us of his body that was on the cross in our place, uh, that it reminds us of that sacrifice that he died a physical death um, in our place, sinless, but taking on our sins. Thank you, Father, for that sacrifice. Thank you now for the opportunity to remember it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have the fruit of the vine available, we'll uh, pray again together, and then you're encouraged to, to partake. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you also for this cup that reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed. We know that the shedding of his blood makes atonement, makes forgiveness possible, makes it a reality. And Father, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for, again, the sacrifice, but we're also thankful for the opportunity, opportunity this morning to remember it together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Separate from the Lord's Supper, of course, uh, at this time we often take up a contribution both for the work here locally as well as in Athens and other works that we support. Uh, as you know, there's a place in the foyer. If you're prepared to make a contribution, you may uh, do so uh, after services. If you'll pray with me again, we'll uh, pray about our giving. Our Father in heaven, again, we're, we're thankful for the, the blessings that we have and the riches that we enjoy, um, certainly in comparison to most of the rest of the world. Uh, Father. Uh, we thank you for providing for us. Uh, Father, we pray that we'd be good stewards of what we have, that we would use our things as we should. 
And we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to share some of our money, some of the financial blessings that we have, uh, to share it together and allow it to be used through this congregation. And we pray, Father, that uh, our elders will be wise and make good decisions about uh, the use of these funds and that in all things you would be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song 133 in your hymnals. 133, I stand amazed. If you would please stand for this song. We'll be singing the first, second verse and the fifth verse. I stand amazed. <clears throat> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Well, good morning. Are we good? Okay, sorry. 
So for those that didn't hear me at home, um, <laughs> I'm not going to repeat myself. But uh, we're, we're moving through the uh, temptations of Jesus. So, so far in our series, we've talked about how um, God is, is not the source of evil desires. That, that's one thing that we talked about and we discussed through this series, that our temptations... Um, are, come from within us, that we have this inner desire that we chase after. In fact, we, uh, we set it before ourselves as a trap. We entice ourselves with it. And, and this temptation, this lust, um, we, we um, uh, consume it and it traps us, if you will. And uh, we become trapped by our own devices. We talked about temptation um, as being something, a desire for something good something inherently good but suddenly becomes evil uh, when it is mistreated or misused how things like food can can be good but they can also be evil desires if they are mistreated or misused relationships can be very good but they can also be evil desires if they are mistreated and they are misused we talked about that as the lust of the flesh uh, those things of this world that are inherently good but become bad when they become evil desires within our hearts. And we talked about our tongue. We talked about the temptation to uh, gossip and slander, uh, things of that nature, and how the things that come out of our mouth are a reflection of what's in the heart. And it's not so much holding our tongue as it is having a change of heart that will lead to different words that are coming out of our mouth, um, things that are more loving and kind because our heart has been transformed into a heart like Jesus. And so we talked about that and how that changes us and the temptation to use our words, which are inherently good and productive, for something bad uh, and creating some unrepairable damage to people and relationships. How words truly can hurt us. So this morning, we're going to wrap up our series, and I want us to talk about overcoming temptations. Overcoming temptations before they overcome us. And so we're going to look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 8 and 10. This is that last temptation of Jesus. And it says, again, the devil uh, took him to a very high mountain. So if you're kind of following along, we, we have uh, Jesus being led into the wilderness uh, by the Spirit and, and Satan appearing to him after Jesus had fasted for a period of 40 days. And so Satan appears and begins to tempt him. And then we have Satan uh, um, leading Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple. And now he's going up a mountain. Uh, we really need to think about Moses, don't we? We need to think about Israel. We need to put that into perspective because that's what's going on here. And, and so it continues on and says that he leads him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory and said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And then in verse 10, And Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so as I'm, I'm reading through that and I'm thinking about it and kind of meditating on those words and studying them, and, and a lot of questions come to mind. Uh, one particular question came to mind right off the bat was, Did Jesus, or did Satan rather, could Satan... Uh, do this? I mean, was this something that Satan had the ability to do? Did he have the power uh, to do this? That was my first question after reading the text. And I think Luke kind of helps us out a little bit on this. So if you'll turn to Luke chapter 4 and verse 6, Luke chapter 4 and verse 6, Luke words it a little differently, and it's, it's helpful uh, to look at this parallel passage. And Luke says, And the devil said to him, I will give you, I will give you all this dominion and its glory. Remember when we talked about glory several, several months ago and we talked about the word glory and what it means? It's an elevated status. That's the idea of glory. And, and Satan is looking at all of this uh, world, all of the world kingdoms, and talking about their dominion, their authority, and talking about their elevated status amongst all the other people of the world. And, and so and then he says, For it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Really interesting because Jesus is going to talk about, use some very similar language about things pertaining to, to heaven itself, things pertaining to eternal life, things pertaining to life. And Satan is using this language to say that all these kingdoms of the world, they have been handed over to me, and I can give them to whomever I wish. So Luke kind of helps us out with the understanding of this. And I think 
at least for me, in my mind, as I think about the devil, um, I think about him as an evil influence in the world. I know I've said that before, but it's really helpful for me. He is evil personified. He is like Pharaoh. Pharaoh became uh, the, the evil influence in the world, kind of a type of Satan, if, if you will. And then we see places like Babylon, and Babylon becomes an evil nation. If you look through Revelation, you begin to realize that Rome was called Babylon because it reflects on the character and nature of that nation and the corruptness of it. And so there are different things of the Old Testament that help us in foreshadowing and, and typology and just giving us an image of what we're talking about here. And so when I think about the devil, I think about him as an evil influence, right? He, he's out there. He's real. I don't deny that. I think that he's real, a real entity, but he's also a real problem too, right? And, and so whenever people succumb to their evil desires, they are submitting themselves to the devil's influence in the world. And Jesus suddenly becomes an influence for, for good and righteousness. And any time in the world when we submit to that which is good and, and righteous, we're submitting to King Jesus. And so there is a way that we can see that that kind of brings to light the idea of this evil influence. And, and so we can say that every nation or every kingdom of the world that is being influenced by evil. So every nation, every kingdom that is succumbing and being influenced by evil is um, going against the will of God and is under Satan's power. They are under an evil influence. So, so just think about nations today. Think about world leaders. Think about people um, in these nations having to submit to a nation that not, doesn't always make good decisions, right? Um, I think that since the coming of the kingdom, since the coming of the king, since Jesus came, things have drastically changed in ways that we really cannot quantify. But if you think back in the Old Testament history about what nations did and who they were and, and the, the horrific things that took place back in places like Sodom and Gomorrah, in places like Nineveh, in the Assyrians, in the Babylonians, I mean, there were some things that were going on in those days that we would we would look at today and just be horrified at. Now, that's not to say that stuff isn't going on today, but I do believe that from the coming of Jesus, that his coming has so influenced the world, that the kingdom has so influenced the world, that even nations, whether they think it or not, are being influenced by King Jesus. But they're still evil. They're still going against the will of God. They're still ignoring the wisdom of God. They're still not taking their proper place as a ruler in God's world. It is God's world, ultimately. But they're not taking their place, and they're abusing their power, they're abusing their position, they're abusing the people that they have uh, authority over. And when a nation does that, it comes under Satan's power. They are handed over to Satan. Satan has authority over that nation because they have chosen to go that direction. Now that applied to Israel too. That wasn't unique to pagan nations. Israel, when Israel chose to go against the will of God, they suddenly became Satan's nation in a sense. In fact, Jesus in the Gospels of John will call Satan the ruler of this world. That he has power over this world as people choose to do evil and go against the will of God. But not just nations, right? We talk about nations, we talk about that in that sense. But not just nations, but people also. Individuals. Individuals within their own life can choose to submit to the authority of, of Jesus, of God, or they could submit to the ruler of this world, the one who has dominion, the one who is in himself power, influence over evil nations. We, as personal individuals, can also find ourselves in that position as well. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, talking to the Ephesian church, and he says that you were all dead in your trans trespasses and your sins. Now, I like to look at that word dead as condemned to die. They, they have committed a crime that they are now guilty of, 
and they are on death row, right? I mean, they are condemned to die, uh, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, Paul says, according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, we recognize that as being that evil influence in the world, right? This evil influence of whatever form it takes, okay? Now, this is what we need to get. If it's an evil ruler, an evil emperor, evil people, these worshipers are false gods. All of these people become influences in the society in which they reside, and they become workers of Satan. All of a sudden, it's, it's really kind of interesting how we think about it. Because if you were to ask them, they would say, well, I'm not a worker of Satan. I don't do Satan's work. If you do evil, and you go against the will of God, and you encourage others to do the same, guess what? You're influencing people to do what Satan wants them to do. You, that's how that seems to work. And so Satan becomes this evil influence. But they're walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So the word world in this context, we need to kind of wrap our head around Bible language, the words world and earth and different words like that that are used in the, on our Bible all throughout. The word world in this context is talking about world order. It's talking about nations. It's talking about kingdoms. It's talking about people, right? And we can look back in Genesis uh, 6 and 7 when God destroyed the world. Obviously, he didn't destroy the earth. It's still here, right? The earth is still here. But he did wipe off sinful man. Now, animals went with that as well. But, I mean, sinful man was the focus. The sinful, disobedient people of Noah's day were wiped off the earth, and it says that God destroyed the world. And so using it in that context helps us to understand what's going on. So these Ephesians were walking, right? They were walking according to the course of this world, a path. Um, they were on a journey, right? It was a destructive journey, but they were on it. And so the whole world has a course that it's going. It's all under Satan's influence. They've all chosen to sin against God. They've all gone against the will of God. They've all gone and worshipped other gods. Some of those gods are themselves. Doesn't necessarily have to be a literal uh, God form, but the idea is that they have gone elsewhere to find what God is willing to provide for them. And so they're walking the course of this world, and they're doing things that are contrary to the will of God. But Paul says it's according to the prince of the power of the air. So there's this evil influence. It's in the air, right? I mean, sometimes we say that, you know, you wake up and you've got allergies, and you're like, man, it's, it's in the air. You know, I mean, we say that for other things, too. But, I mean, that's, that's kind of the idea. There is this power that is evil, and it is working against us. And, and we need to be careful. And these people, like us, I mean, we can put ourselves in here, too. We have at one time succumbed to that and walked that course. We've been there. We've done that. We've walked that life. We've been under Satan's influence of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So... There are two paths here that Paul's laying out here that people can take, right? There, there is this, this path of disobedience that is Satan's path, right? The world's path. He has control over the world, and these people are following after him, whether they know it or not, and that's the path that they have chosen. So they've taken this course. They've taken this path. But there is this other path that Paul's going to talk about, and it's a path that is in submission to God. It is a path that questions everything. Everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, you have already put it up against the will of God. You have already looked, you've searched, you've studied, you know what God desires, and you've already asked the question, is this something that pleases my Heavenly Father before you even made the choice to do it? See, you're under God's influence. And when we think about it in terms of, of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, and we say that, that I have chosen, because of Jesus, I have chosen to love my neighbor instead of hate them and destroy them and destroy their property. I have chosen to, to love my neighbor. I, I have chosen to do good. I have chosen to watch what I say, watch what I watch, watch what I look at with my eyes and what I hear with my ears. I have, I have made choices because of Jesus to live differently, 
and have a different walk and not be under the influence of evil and not follow the course of the world, but I have, I have chosen to follow the course of a regenerated, recreated world that began in Jesus. And I have chosen that path. And now I don't look to myself, I don't look to somebody else, I don't follow after somebody else, but I look to Jesus for answers. And when I want to know how to conduct myself in this world, I look to Him and I find the path that He is taking. You know, the Bible calls this spiritual. <laughs> we are being influenced, we're being empowered by God, His Word, and we are spiritual. But when we are being empowered and influenced by evil desires and worldly ways, and we're taking that other course, we're carnal. We're carnal people. We're just, we're just doing what the rest of the world does. Isn't that easier sometimes, though? I mean, it's, it's easier to just kind of go along, get along, don't ruffle any feathers, do what everybody else is doing. Sometimes that's a lot easier, but it's not beneficial, right? It's not going to empower us to do the things that God wants us to do. It's not going to, to bring us into this position where we are walking in a path in a way that is pleasing to God. It's not going to change our lives and transform us the way King Jesus will change our lives and transform us. And then he says in verse 3, he says, Among them you too all formerly lived in the lust of your flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, by nature doesn't mean they were born that way, okay? That, that's very confusing, I know. But really, that idea of nature is just fleshly, okay? Say, so by nature. All right, what does that all mean? Well, it means that humanity has chosen a way. They did it from the garden, didn't they? they from the very beginning, Adam and Eve were not born with a sin nature, were they? Did God create Adam with a sin nature? Now, here's the next question. Did Adam sin? Well, there's kind of a contradiction in the theology when we say that we're born with a sin nature because Adam was not, and he sinned. So we just follow the course that Adam followed. We, we see it, we want it, we desire it, we take it, we eat it, and boom, we've sinned against our God. We follow that course. And the world has offered these two paths, right? God has offered a path, and the world is offering another path. There are these two paths. We have to choose which one we're going to walk. And he says, but these Ephesians, they too, all they formally lived in that. That was their world. That's who they were. They were pagan, idol worshipers that followed the ways of this world and, and submitted to the power of the devil. Whether they admitted it or not, that's where they were. They were outside of God. They were away from God. And Paul says that they were in the lust of their flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So the second nature, that's what this is. It's a nature that comes from following everybody else. It, it's a nature that comes from following the evil influence that was introduced into the garden in the beginning of time in the present. Still there, still powerful, still cunning, still crafty but still evil. And so we, we see that even today, right? I mean, you look around you today. Is Satan still influencing the world today? Are there people today who are still following after the path of Satan? And you might think, well, that was me. And we all need to think that, right? I hope that you're on that end of the thought process. I hope, I hope that you're on the thought process that Paul is saying the Ephesians were on to say that I was that way. That formerly was my way of living. I used to indulge in those things. It's not my life anymore. I so hope that that's you. And if it's not you, then the Bible says that we need to repent of that and we need to turn to Jesus and we need to be cleansed of all of our sins and walk the new walk that God has created for us in Christ Jesus. That, that's the thing we need to do. But as for now, we need to be comforted in knowing that that's who we once were. That's where God's, God's wrath falls on those people. Did you know that? We love talking about God's grace. We love talking about God's love. I mean, that's such a wonderful thing. But God's wrath falls on the disobedient. The Hebrew writer says that's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. It is, isn't it? We need to be mindful of that. 
We need to think about those things, but we also need to recognize that God's grace has brought us out of that so that we can walk in a new way. Not so we can live the old life, but that we can live a new life in Christ Jesus, empowered by his spirit, a spiritual life, and that's what we're looking for. So the devil has power. He has authority over the disobedient. He has power over those who indulge the desires of the flesh freely. Does that mean we don't sin? Well, no, that's not what he's saying. Does that mean that we don't make mistakes as Christians? No, that's, that's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is these people lived in that. That's what they did. They indulged in it. That was who they were. It defined them. It identified them as a person. He has power, Satan does. Satan has power over those who choose to walk the course the world is walking. Satan said that all these things I will give to you. <laughs> right? I mean, it, wow, what a challenge, right? All these things, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Now, the challenge is trying to understand what Satan's talking about. I mean, what is he offering? What, what's going on here? Because that's my second question. Why was this ever enticing to Jesus? I mean, knowing how worlds are, knowing how kingdoms are, I mean, why would he even want that? Why would he be enticed by this? Why is this even a desire? Or is it a desire? I mean, what, was it just some kind of formality? I mean, did Satan throw this stuff at him and just see what's going to stick? And Jesus is over like, whatever, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. You know, is that how that worked? Or is there something more to the story that we need to grip onto? Is there something more to the nature of the humanity of Jesus that we need to understand within ourselves and see power to overcome it? That's what we're looking for. Or is this something that really, truly enticed Jesus? Was this really a temptation for Jesus? Now, I want you to think about it this way. If it is true, and I believe it's true, that Satan has power and influence over the world, I believe that those who are disobedient, those who have gone against the will of God, those who have chosen not to follow God, whether it's fully, partially, it doesn't make any difference. You can't be a lukewarm person, can you? You can't halfway in, halfway out. That doesn't work for God, right? You're all in or all out. And so there's this idea that, that people, Jews, who thought themselves righteous were actually under the influence of Satan. They thought they were righteous. They thought they were right with God. They thought they were good. They thought they did good things. They prayed constantly. They fasted all the time. They gave all kinds of money. They wore the shiny clothes. They did all this stuff. But they were under the influence of the devil because they had not fully and truly committed themselves to God. And they were trusting in themselves and glorifying themselves and looking for glory within the world and not within God. And so here, here's my thought on this. What if, what if Satan suddenly let go of all the influence he had on the world? I think that's what he's offering. What if Satan suddenly let go of that and he backed off? Right? What, what if he ended his quest to destroy all of God's good creation? What if he just quit? Given up. Backing off. I'm not going to influence anybody anymore. I'm not going to entice anybody anymore. I'm not doing anything. I'm letting it go. If you worship me, Jesus, I will let go of the hold that I have rightfully on the disobedient world. I'm going to let go of it. I'm going I'm to allow you to take control of that. I'm going to step back. I'm going to let go of the power that I have over death. The Hebrew writer tells us that, that Satan has power over death. I'm going to let go of that. And Jesus is going to step in and be king of all kings, lord of all lords. That's the offer. I believe that's the offer. I believe that's what Satan is telling Jesus, that I'm going to back off and you're going to step in. What good could Jesus do in the world if Satan had backed off? He could do a lot of good, right? I mean... He could be a king of Israel. He can bring Israel up and raise them up, and they can be a blessing to all nations. They can be the people that God desired for them to be because he would lead them to victory. But, but, but is that the path that God put Jesus on? That's the question. It's not, is it? That's not the course that Jesus was on. That's not the path that Jesus was on. Jesus was not on that path. That's another choice for him, right? Jesus is now faced with two choices. Bow down to Satan. He's going to let go of all of his power. And Jesus is going to step in and take over and be king. Or, 
Here's the other choice. Continue following God's will and doing what He desires, completing the plan, surrendering Himself to God, suffering, dying on a cross, and then being exalted and glorified as King of kings and Lord of lords. Those are the two paths. Which one's easier? <laughs> Bowing down to Satan. Wouldn't that be so much easier? It'd be easier, wouldn't it, just to bow down to Satan and Satan's going to let go of all his power. You're going to step in. You're going to be king. It's all going to be good. The other one's hard. It's painful. Not just physically, but emotionally, as Jesus is going to lose friends and Jesus is going to lose family and Jesus is going to suffer hardships and rejection. As Jesus is going to be betrayed by those who are closest to him, as Jesus is going to be taken from amongst his own people, his own kinsmen, and he's going to be handed over to a pagan nation to be brutally beaten, mocked, tortured, bloody, bruised, hung on a cross to die. What a horrific thing to go through. But that was the second choice. But the second choice was the right choice because it was the one that God put Jesus on. The first one had always been there. Jesus could have always succumbed to his own desires. Jesus could have always just said, I'm just going to do it my way. He always had that choice, but he didn't take it. Satan is tempting him to take it. Right? And so Israel, if you remember the story, if you read through the Gospels, you might recall that, that even the Jews try to take Jesus by force and make him a king. Right? That temptation is going to come up again. They're going to take him by force, they're going to take the Messiah, and they're going to make him a king because that's exactly what they wanted, wasn't it? They wanted what Satan wanted. They wanted Jesus to suddenly take the throne in Jerusalem, to be the king of Israel. They, they wanted Jesus, rather, to be the king of Israel, the Messiah to have power, to have authority, to be the chosen one of God, and to lead Israel to victory. But thankfully, for us, God had a bigger plan, didn't he? It wasn't about just saving physical Israel. It wasn't just about bringing Israel to victory, but it was about bringing the world to victory, about changing everything, about taking Jews and Gentiles and bringing them into one family belonging to Jesus and, and recreating everything again, a new, a fresh, a regenerated world. And that's the plan. Easy way out? The course of the world? That's always available to us, isn't it? That's always choice number one. From, from day one, when we begin to live in this world, that is the one path that is so broad, that is so open to us, that's so available to us, that's so tempting to take, isn't it? The second path that's being offered through Jesus is not as easy because it's a path sometimes of suffering. It's a path sometimes of pain. It's a path sometimes of loss, relationships, friendships, families, life. It's the path of the cross. And we have to make that choice also in our own life. And so Jesus is suddenly faced with these two choices. And Jesus, you know, his response is really simple, right? Go. Just, just go away. I don't want that course. I don't want to take that path. I don't want to bow down to you and worship you because God has something better for me. God has a better plan. God has a better path. And I'm taking that one. It might be more painful, it may not be as desirable, but I'm taking it because it's better. It's better. It has a better ending, right? I mean, that's what we want. We want a better ending. We're willing to succumb to pain for a while, aren't we? If we believe that the ending is going to be better. We're willing to, to do things, you know, in this world to to go to college. I mean, that's hard. That's not easy. Nobody, you know, really gets up and says, man, I'm going to go and study for hours and hours and hours and take tons of exams and write tons of essays and drink lots of coffee and stay up all night. Nobody really wants that. But we know that the end result of that path is a good one. Right? We know that there's something, a light at the end of the tunnel that's going to be so worth it that when we look at that path and we look at the difficulties that we will face during it, that we say, it's worth it. We're faced with the same choice through Jesus. 
We have to be willing to take the path that might be more difficult, but it's worth it. And Jesus was willing to take that path because to reject that path is to bow down to, to Satan and worship him. Put him first, his ways first, to succumb to the power of the world. Folks, I wish, I wish there was this, this magic pill, right, that you could just say, you know, take this and you're going to overcome all temptations. It's all going to be over. You don't have to worry about it anymore. I wish that were true, but the, the fact is we're going to be tempted in this world. But we see passages like James chapter 4 and verse 7 where James says, submit yourself to God, right? Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and what will he do? He will flee from you, right? He, he will go. He will get out of here. He, he's going to leave. He's not going to be able to live in the heart of a person who has fully and truly committed themselves and submitted themselves to God. And then Paul says to the church in Corinth, this idolatrous church that did all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, we read about them and we think, wow, those guys are nuts. But Paul says to this church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 and 14, he says, no temptation has overtaken you, right? It, none of them. It's never overtaken you, but such as common with man. In other words, what you're going through is not new. <laughs> you might think it's new, and you might think it's tougher than everybody else's temptation. You might think it's more difficult than everybody else, but it's not new. It's always been there from the beginning of time, from Adam and Eve, from the garden, from, from Cain and Abel, all the way throughout history. It's always been there. It's not new. No temptation has overcome you. You have a choice. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it before. And then it says, therefore, in verse 14, therefore, beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from it. Just run away. That's our only choice, right? It's, we're going to be tempted. And we're going to have those desires and we're going to want to do it. But what's the answer? Run away. Flee from it. Get away from it. It's not the right path. Easy, yes. Tempting, yes. Desirable? Absolutely. Available? Yeah. More than we would like to think. Is it right? No. It's not right. It's not right path. In fact, Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, you all are probably very familiar with this passage, but Peter says, Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober. Be on the alert. And then Peter says, the adversary, the devil, he's still out there. You know, he's prowling around like a roaring lion. And he's seeking someone that he can devour, the, the, the weak link, the one who is tempted to look back. Right? You think about gazelle. I don't know if lions hunt gazelles. I don't, not, don't watch the Animal Channel that much. But, you know, if you think about gazelles, you think, you know, which one gets eaten, right? It's the one that looks back. It, it, you know, it's the one that says, I wonder where the lion is, you know, and he's gone. I mean, he's going to trip. He's going to fall. He's going to, you know, not make the right. I mean, that's it. Everybody else who's got their focus forward, they make it flee from the devil, run from him. Don't look back. There's nothing back there. You know, he's calling out all kinds of things that are tempting to us easy paths to take, desirable things for us. It's not worth it. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And then he says in verse 10, he says, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. For these Christians who are suffering persecution, how tempting would it be just to give up? Sometimes that's the temptation. Just throw in the towel. Give it up. Make the hurt stop. How, do we, how often do we want that? Just make the hurt stop. I don't care. Just make it stop. Just make the pain stop. Just make the suffering stop. I'll do anything. Bow down to me. Worship me, Satan says. I'll make it all go away. I'll make it all stop. But the end goal that God has in mind is so much better, so much greater, brings us into victory to a level that we never could have imagined in Jesus. And it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. We could take the easy path. We really could. Or we can take the path of the cross, which is the path that Jesus took, and find victory 
in Jesus as God raises us up and exalts us and glorifies us in Jesus, that we become his holy people in Jesus, that we have victory in Jesus. And that's what that teaches us, right? It teaches us to do the very thing that Jesus did, to worship, commit ourselves fully and totally to the Lord, to worship him and him only, right? To put him in the place that he belongs and nobody else, nothing else, nothing in this world can fit in that place but God. And when we submit to him fully, we humble ourselves before him and we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Let's pray that we have strength to do that. Let's be encouraged by that. Let's overcome temptation before it overcomes us. Now, if there's anybody here this morning who needs to put on Jesus in baptism, or if there's anybody here who needs the prayers of this congregation for encouragement or for strength, um, if you would please come forward as we stand and sing. Um, if anybody, if you have a desire to come forward, uh, please come forward and sit, and, and Ron and Joe will come, come to you and minister to you, whatever your needs uh, may be. I think I'll sing this. Trust and Obey, 583. When we walk in the Lord, in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all. Good morning to everyone. Glad you were able to join us. Uh, we also welcome all of those that are joining us online. We're glad everyone was able to worship with us. Uh, draw your attention to all of the announcements that uh, are in our news and notes. Draw your attention to the announcement about John Gambino's daughter. We don't have much further information other than it was uh, very sudden. She's not a very old person. She died uh, quickly, but we don't have uh, much additional information. Maybe it'll be forthcoming in uh, this coming week. Uh, please take note of the children's home that we're doing some benevolence for and if you can help with that we would appreciate it i was just handed a note said and i'll just read it we just received information from tommy and jackie johnson former members that the grandson of ted and jody hogan former members was killed in a car accident last night. Request prayers. 
uh, and that's uh, all that I have with that. Uh, there, Ted and Jody are related to Peggy and I and Elizabeth. Uh, they're cousins, they're part of the Estes family. I don't know uh, how many here know them, but they used to worship with us uh, many years ago. So you probably remember them. I do not know where this grandson lived, but uh, please keep them in your prayers. Any other announcements anybody have? Okay, thank you. Nine twenty nine. <clears throat> Nine twenty nine. After this song, we'll have our closing prayer. <clears throat> This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and proudly rings the music of the spheres. This is my Pray together, please. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, and we thank you so much for this house you provide for us to gather together, fellowship with one another, and most importantly, together to worship you. Dear Lord, we ask that you would just be with those of our number who are sick, Lord, those who are in the hospital, and we ask that you would just reach down and strengthen them and bring them back to us if it be your will. Dear Lord, we ask that you would just be with the John Gambino family and and his daughter, the Halls. We ask that you would just be with them, Lord, as they're suffering. We ask that you would be, be with Ted and Jody Hogan and all of their family, Lord, and the loss of this grandson. And we ask again that you would just reach down and touch them and strengthen them. Dear Lord, be with us as we go out away from the church, Lord. And, into our community, just be with us, and we hope and pray that we can be the Christians you want us to be, and we hope that the fellow men around us know that we are your children. Dear Lord, forgive us our many sins and shortcomings and where we fail thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>